All right, let's go to the Bible. Genesis chapter 41. We're going to start in about verse 37 and uh, read maybe to the whole passage goes to the end of the chapter, verse 57. What I'd like for us to do is read to about verse 45 or so. So if you found Genesis 41, why don't you stand in honor of the reading of God's word and we will get started today. Genesis 41, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Join me in the middle of the story. I'll go back and pick it up in verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and he put it on Joseph's hand. Then he clothed him in garments of fine linen. And he put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee, or yours might say, kiss the ground. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Penea, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph, he went out over the land of Egypt. Join me as we pray. Father, by your grace, you have saved us, saved us through faith in Jesus. And we trust in your grace alone. We ask today that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear, and our hearts to believe, to see from the Old Testament the joy of the New Testament in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we ask you to grip our hearts now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you've been with us this year, you know that we've been covering the patriarchs. Those are the Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We spent the last eight weeks or so on Joseph. I feel like we probably got another eight weeks or so in his life before we finish it up. And Joseph stands alone among the patriarchs. He's the only one in the Old Testament of the patriarchs. He's the only one that never had anything negative said about him. He's the only one that understood biblical marriage. It seems like there's no mention of him ever being married but to one woman. He is the only patriarch that had a monogamous marriage. And furthermore, in all of the Old Testament, Joseph stands alone, giving us the clearest foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come to save us from our sins. An old preacher named F.B. Meyer, he invites us to think of the parallels between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Jesus would be rejected by the Jews. Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus would be betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph had his garment, remember the, the coat of many colors? Joseph had his garments ripped from him. Jesus had his robe torn from him. Joseph was down in the prison between two criminals. Jesus hung on a cross between two thieves. 
With Joseph, one of those criminals perished and was executed. One of them was saved and restored. With Jesus, one of those thieves died and went to hell. And one of those thieves was with him today in paradise. In the end of the story, Joseph is raised to the position of prime minister of all of Egypt. In the same way, Jesus will be raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is now Lord of lords and King of kings. In the story, Pharaoh will tell all the people of the world, go to Joseph and be saved. The gospel message is, go to Jesus, for he is the way and the truth and the life. And so today we are dropped into this story. To the story of Joseph, as he now comes from the prison after being a slave, after being in prison, he is now ascending into his position of success and authority and usefulness. And even as Joseph's life points us to Jesus, and he does, he also gives us an example. He gives us a profile in faithfulness, and he reminds us of what God can do in the life of one believer just like you. So I'm asking you today, by God's grace... To live your life clinging to Christ in a daily effort to bring honor to the name of Jesus. So if you're looking for a theme today, here's what the theme will be. I'll go ahead and give it to you plainly. God's grace is clearly seen in your faithfulness. God's grace, how is it going to be seen? It will be clearly seen in your faithfulness. What I want to do today is take this story and um, let's just sort of walk through the story. I'm going to use three phrases. They're not even full sentences. Three phrases to sort of be anchor points for us to understand this part of Joseph's life. Here's the first phrase. Number one. Number one is evidence of grace. Evidence of grace. That if you are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, there's going to be something that's happened in your life to such a degree that there will be evidence of God's grace. If God's grace has gripped you, if God's grace has gripped your life, there will be clear evidence of the gospel. Let's see if we can illustrate it with Joseph's life. We've been dropped into a story in chapter 41 that's sort of already in progress. Let me catch us all up if you weren't here before. After Joseph stands before Pharaoh and he explains the dreams to the Pharaoh. And there is a man that is fresh out of prison. They shaved him, cleaned him up, stood him in front of Pharaoh. He explained all of the bad dreams that Pharaoh was having. And then after explaining them from verse 33... Verse 33, 34, 35, and 36. Then, after explaining, Joseph gives a very clear plan as to how you're going to get out of this jam, telling Pharaoh. And after explaining how the plan will work, we pick up the story in verse 37. I want you to see in verse 37 and 38 and 39, listen to what this pagan, this pagan Pharaoh says about Joseph. Let's... Pick up the story, verse 37, 38, and 39. This proposal pleased Pharaoh. What proposal? The one that Joseph made in verses 33 through 36, the plan that he gave him. Verse 37 says, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all of his ser servants. Now listen to what Pharaoh said in verse 38. <clears throat> Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of of God. Especially verse 38. I'll just stop there. The Spirit of God. Notice that Pharaoh, who was a pagan, Pharaoh recognized in this young man standing in front of him, there is something different going on. 
He knew that there's something happening in Joseph's life and the source of that something was outside of Joseph. He called it God. Here's the first time you find in the entire Bible, in the book of Genesis, the very first time you have someone being talked about as having the spirit of God in them. Now, certainly Pharaoh, when he used that phrase, spirit of God, he, remember, he's not... He doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. He worships the sun God and several other gods. He is a polytheist. He is not a monotheist. Monotheist is worship one God, poly, many gods. His statement here is certainly tinged with polytheism. It's tinged with paganism. But as he looked at Joseph standing there in front of him, he saw evidence, although he didn't understand it, he saw evidence of God's grace. In fact, you might even say in verse 38 of chapter 41 that the Pharaoh preached more gospel than he will ever know. Pontius Pilate did the same thing, hung Jesus on a cross and put a sign over Jesus' head and said, Jesus Christ, Son of God, preaching more gospel than he would ever believe. Same thing happened over in John chapter 11. When there was such an uproar about Jesus, John tells us in John chapter 11, verse 49 and 50. Listen to what the high priest Caiaphas says, who never believed in Jesus. But one of them, Caiaphas, was the high priest that year. And he said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. In the same way, in Genesis chapter 41, in the same way, Pharaoh stood, stood in front of Joseph and said more than he understood. Why? Because he could see evidence of God's grace in that boy. Which I think begs a question for us. I think it asks the question, is there evidence of God's grace in your life? Now here's what I mean. When I say evidence of God's grace, I mean, is there in your life evidence of God's grace that gives you confidence sitting here today that you indeed are a Christian, that you are in the faith? One of the great leaders and writers and thinkers of, of the Southern Baptist Convention and really of evangelicalism is a man named Don Whitney. Don Whitney has written several books that have been helpful to Christians for several years. Uh, one of those books is Disciplines of the Christian Life. That is a really good book. Don Whitney is his name. I would commend that book to you. Uh, the most recent book he wrote was uh, Praying the Bible. He helps you think through how your prayers can be centered on God's Word. Praying the Bible, I would commend that book to you. A lesser known book that he wrote many years ago <clears throat> is entitled Ten Questions to diagnose your spiritual health. If you don't have that book, it's a small little, it's almost like a pamphlet. You can read it with one eye shut. I mean, it really is not that big, but it is helpful. Let me just give you a couple of the questions that Don Whitney asked in his little book. Let them roll around in your mind a bit. Here's the first question. Do you thirst for God? Do you in your life want more of God? As a believer in Jesus who's been converted, is your heart beating for the gospel? Do you thirst for God? Here's the second question. Are you increasingly governed by God's word? Are you? Not by society, not by tradition, not by your background. Are you increasingly governed, controlled by God's word? Is it washing over your life enough that you are becoming more and more colored by God's word? Are you increasingly governed by God's word? Here's a third question. Are you more loving after you became a Christian? Seems like sometimes people get saved and after they got saved become more hateful. You're going the wrong way. If you are more hateful after you became a Christian, you got it all wrong. The question is, are you, because of what Christ has done in you, you've been a changed person, are you more loving? Here's a fourth question. Do you have a deep concern 
for the spiritual needs of others. Do you, when you, the, the neighborhood that you live in, if you live in an apartment, the people that live on your floor, does it grieve you that people around you don't know Christ? Does it bother you to the degree that you are going to build a relationship with someone so that you can share the gospel? Do you have a deep concern for the spiritual needs of other people? Here's a fifth question. I'll just give you five or six or seven of these. Here's a fifth one. I'm not gonna, I only use all 10. There are probably some copyright issues. I'll just give you five or, or six of them. Here's the fifth one. Are the spiritual disciplines important to you? Spiritual disciplines like worship on the Lord's Day, um, standing under God's Word, taking the Lord's Supper, spending time in prayer, giving. You would be amazed at the number of people that will join a church and come to church and belong to the church and never actually systematically give to the church. Are the spiritual disciplines important to you? Just two more. <clears throat> Do you grieve over sin? More importantly, do you grieve over your sin? Are you more bothered about your sin than you are about the sins that have been committed against you? Because let's be honest about it. The sins you've committed against God are much higher of an offense than the sins that have been committed against you. Are you grieving over your own sin? And number seven, here's a question to check your own evidence of grace. Do you forgive people quickly? When someone has done something against you, are you able, because you are a product of God's grace in your life, you understand what it took for you to be forgiven, are you able to forgive people quickly? You see, when Jesus changes you, it's not just some decision that you make. It is a life that God has given you in Christ and there will always be evidence of God's grace. Let me give you a second phrase. Evidence of God's grace is the first phrase. Let me give you the second phrase. That second phrase is centered by the gospel. Centered by the gospel. Not just centered in the gospel. I mean, you've been centered by the gospel. The gospel has so gripped your life, it has centered you. Let's go back to the story. Join me in verse 40 to about verse 45. In verses 40 through about verse 45, you'll see Pharaoh. He's going to elevate Joseph and just look at what happens to him. Now, remember, 24 hours before this, he was in a prison having been a slave. They had to clean him up. They had to shave him. They had to get him ready to even stand there. And now listen to what Pharaoh does. I'll just sort of, I'll just sort of go through the verses. Uh, you can join me in verse 40. <clears throat> Listen to what he says. You, your former prisoner, you shall be over my house and all of my people. They will do what you tell them to do. In fact, you're second to me. Only in regards to the throne am I going to be above you. Verse 41. Pharaoh said to him, look, I have put the entire country under your command. Watch what happens in verse 42. Pharaoh took his signet ring off of his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. Everybody's watching this go on. Not only that, he put some, some fine linen garments on him. Now, Joseph's had a tough time with coats in his history. He had to coat him in the colors. He ripped him off. He had another coat that uh, Potiphar's wife saw him. She tore, tore it off of him. This time he has a coat on that will never be taken from him. Not only that, after verse 42, he uh, put a gold chain around his neck. Verse 43, he put him in his second chariot. There he is as the prime minister, following behind the king. And he made it so that people out in public would bow down in front of him. Some Bibles say bow the knee. Uh, some say kiss the ground. It depends on, is, is it Egyptian or Hebrew? But obviously there is homage being paid there. And the text goes on to say, not only that, verse 44, Pharaoh says, now, now don't get it wrong, I am Pharaoh. I'm not making you Pharaoh, but you are second to me. And then in verse 45, he gets his, um, he, he gets his life 
changed. Pharaoh says, I'm going to change your name so you now are accepted into uh, high society here in Egypt. Not only that, I'm going to give you a woman. He gave him a wife. She was the daughter of the high priest of the sun god. Now Pharaoh is, is making it so that Joseph is moving on up in society. He is doing really well. And this is where so many people fall. So often, so often it's the promotion or it's more money that give you more luxuries that get you away from the Lord that ruin people. Certainly it's remarkable that through all of his adversity, Joseph was able to keep his eyes on God. But what I think is more remarkable is the way that Joseph through all his prosperity, was able to keep his eyes on God. So often, this is why we hate the prosperity gospel. So often, prosperity breeds compromise. But you see, in the story, Joseph gets all of these promotions up to verse 45, and he's able to keep a grasp on how God is using him, it goes right after the promotion, verse 45. You'll see it in verse 46. He starts following through with the plan that God had gave him. So how do we? How do we stay faithful in good times? I know how to tell you to stay faithful in bad times. Those bad times, uh, you throw yourself on the mercy of God. When sometimes all you have is God, that is the best time in your life. You reach for God. But how do you do it in the good times? I'd like, to say, I'd like to suggest that we are to be like Joseph in verse 42. In verse 42, Joseph put on the royal garment that would never be taken from him again. In the same way, you and I are to put on Christ. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to satisfy its desires. You know, one of the evidences of God's grace in your life is that you not only are centered on the gospel that you believe it, but that you have been actually centered by the gospel. Now, when I say gospel, for those of you that maybe don't have a clear picture of what the gospel is, when I say gospel, here's what I mean. The God of the Bible is a holy and just creator. This God has created every person in here and everything you see. He created you as a human being in his image, but that image in you has been disfigured because of your own personal sin. So God is holy and man who has been created in his image is now a sinner. That sin has separated us from God because He's holy, we are sinful, and we cannot be in His presence or He in our presence. We need help. That help comes in the form of a Redeemer, Jesus. God is holy, man is a sinner. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died on the cross in the place of sinners. God raised Him from the dead. That's the gospel. And the gospel is this, if you will turn from your sin and by faith believe in Jesus, the Bible says you will be saved. You see, you and I are to give evidence of God's grace in our lives. We are to be centered. That gospel centers us. Let me give you a third phrase, third phrase. <clears throat> this is probably the hardest, number three. Peace with the past. Peace with the past. Some of you can look just over your shoulder and there you see things that are not peaceful. If you've been hurt, discriminated against, you've been damaged, you've been abused, that stuff is really hard to get over. Some of you sitting here today, you know that all too well. 
I mean, think about how easy it would be for Joseph to, to hold on to bitterness against his brothers. To hate those people that had done him so wrong. We would have even said, hey, I understand why he hates those people. You can even rationalize some of the bitterness that you carry because you were done so wrong. Now, we have the advantage of reading. We know that if his brothers hadn't hated him, if he hadn't been sold into slavery, if he had not been imprisoned, that he would never uh, have ruled Egypt. But even still, what they did to him has hurt him. You've been hurt before. And this hurt runs deep. But I want you to notice something tucked away in verse 50 and 51 and 52. And specifically in verse 51 and 52. Look at the names. Names are important in the Old Testament. Look at the names of the sons that God gave him. Notice what he names them. Let me, let me read it to you. I'll start in verse 50 for context. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all of my hardship and all of my father's house. The name of the second was called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Take those two names, Manasseh and Ephraim. There's just a couple of things to point out about those two names. Number one, they are Jewish names indicating to us even though he's risen in this society, this pagan society, he has held on his faith in the God of the Bible, naming his children Jewish names. But more importantly to us, there's something that these names signify. You see it in verse 51 and 52. In verse 51, Manasseh. Jo Joseph is saying, God has made me forget all of my hardships, all of my father's house. And he's not saying that I cut those people out. That's not what he's saying. I'm done with those people. No, what he's saying is God has healed my wounds. Not only that, drop down to verse 52. There you find Ephraim. God has made me fruitful. You see that in the second name in Ephraim, verse 52? God, this ought to be some of you, this ought to be your life verse, verse 52. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Some of you need to claim that for yourself. If, if you, listen, if you get so obsessed with disappointments, if you get so obsessed with hurts, if you hold on to that bitterness much longer, your life is going to be warped. Joseph couldn't live like that. Joseph did what some of you need to do today. You need to drop that past off in the ocean of God's grace. Isn't that, isn't that what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 when he describes the Christian struggle? Listen to what Paul, let me, let me, let me, let me close with this. Philippians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 and 14. Paul writes, <clears throat> Not that I have already obtained this. I'm not there yet. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Here's what I do. I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus.
You see, God's grace is evidence. And God's grace is seen in your faithfulness. God's grace is experienced when you turn from your sin and by faith turn to Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that you live in the grace of God. Will you join me as we pray together? With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment and prayer. In just a little while we'll be having the Lord's Supper, but before we do that, we want to open this time up for you. Part of our tradition at Hickory Grove is you hear a sermon and then we have an opportunity to respond to that sermon. And so this morning when we sing, I'm going to invite any of you here that need, you need a pastor to pray with you. You maybe want to talk about your own salvation. Maybe you've understood for the first time what it means to give your life to Christ. Maybe seeing the baptisms today reminded you that although you've professed Jesus, you've never been baptized. However God has worked in your life this morning, when we sing, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, thank you for your word that is good and for your grace that saves. And we pray that in that grace, we pray that you will move today. That Jesus will be glorified and people's lives might be changed. And so we thank you for the joy of serving you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?